Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this one hour session on uh, food waste reduction. This is being organized as part of the Business Against Food Waste campaign um, led by the Malta Business Bureau in collaboration with the HSBC Malta CSR Institute and ITS. Um, this is also being supported by the Ministry for Tourism, the Malta Tourism Authority and WACER. Today, we have um, an excellent set of speakers lined up for you, um, each tackling the issue of food waste from their own different perspectives. Um, we have Kane Vella from Food Swap Malta. We have Malcolm Bowen from Second Bite Malta. And we have Alexandra Kushkiri from the Ministry for the Environment. Um, uh, I really encourage your active participation in this webinar through the chat and the QA function at the bottom. So there you can type out your questions or any comments that you'd like to pass throughout this webinar. Um, and I will read them out and pass the questions on to our speakers. This is going to be a one hour webinar with three different um, interventions by our speakers. Um, uh, I'm really glad to see such um, an excellent turnout for this webinar was I think this is a topic which, um, first of all, the MBB, um, even together with HSBC has been working on for a number of years now. Um, it's really picking up um, speed across Europe and especially in Malta since there are clear um, negatives to generating food waste and clear positives to reducing the waste that we generate. So I really thank all of you for uh, joining us uh, this morning. Uh, we will start off today's webinar with a presentation by Kane Vella, who will introduce his um, his fairly recent platform, which has launched uh, Food Swap Malta. Uh, Kane, are you with us? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, firstly, thank you for having me. Um, it's my pleasure. Um, yes, as, uh, as you said, uh, we launched uh, a platform called Food Swap Malta. Um, and this is actually not trying to reduce um, the waste we create or use it other otherwise, like some other initiatives. This is avoiding the waste being created in the first place. Um, it occurred to me to set this up because um, I, I'm a small farmer, uh, so I have a very small farm in Burmarad, and year after year I see um, crops being grown, um, one, one particular one in my area that we like to grow is globe artichokes, for example. At the start of the season, um, we tend to harvest all of the globe artichoke, but as the season goes on, uh, the markets drop, so we don't sell as many of them. And many of these products go to waste, and it, I mean, the globe artichokes is just one example. So I, I really got sort of annoyed and disheartened because I know how much resource goes into creating these pro this produce. I mean, you need to fertilize, you need to use electricity, and the fertilization can pose a risk of runoff. So there's a lot of environmental impact, um, not to mention the waste of the actual food that's been created by all this energy flow. Um, so I decided to one day, I think it was a, almost a two years ago now, to reinstall the values of community. And I did this by making it more convenient for people to actually communicate through, to one another to swap food. Because swapping food in our community has always been something that's been done, um, especially amongst farmers. Let's say, for instance, I grew something and the other farmer grew something different and we we both have an excess of this type of food with swap we do this with seeds we do it with food we do it with services and we share machinery and this allows for a very efficient use of resource and um, which means our impact on our climate around us is reduced and um, the burden on land filling perhaps let's say for instance you went to the shop you bought the wrong item off the shelf. We, we see this in our community a lot. Maybe, maybe I went to the shop for my partner and I picked up the wrong thing. Um, and it's not feasible to return that item. Um, Food Swap is a, a, an online platform. You can go on there, you can put a picture on there, put your location where you are. And another person that has something else that may desire the thing you have may offer to swap with something they have in excess. 
Um, so those two people would have reduced their waste overall. Um, so it's a very simple concept. It's just bringing back the sense of community in, in the way we use our food. Um, I mean, when we, when we barter for food with money, we're essentially swapping uh, our service or what, what we've worked for for that particular item of food. Um, but yeah, this is, this is one step further because um, if you have something that you've mispurchased or something excess that's sitting on a, on a shelf, and then no amount of money that you earn will will sort of stop that from being wasted essentially and this creates as well a, a very sort of connected community with our food which is important uh, a better understanding of our food and how we use it and how we utilize it especially where it, when it comes to fresh products and um, because we know that some fresh products don't have a, a long shelf life and I think it's becoming more and more important because um, the community are realizing how important it is to grow their own food and to utilize their garden spaces or terraces. And eventually, of course, you will have an excess because you will plant maybe 10 tomato plants and maybe you can't eat all the tomatoes that, that have been produced. And so as well as this, obviously, when you come to swap it, we get a lot of our community members that are sharing recipes or creative ways to use that food. So there's a, a knowledge transfer as well, which is brilliant. And um, yeah, and basically, we, we've set this up online. Uh, we use social media to, to conduct the swaps. But in the future, we hope that maybe somebody would reach out and we could create maybe a local application or even a location where we can drop the food off or have a location where food can be can be swapped mutually between different people. Um, but this is what we look for and hope for in the future for food swap. And we believe that we can solve many issues, even on a commercial scale. We could have maybe industry waste used for other things. And maybe the, the person that is using that industry waste can give something back to the specific company that's creating the industry waste. So in food manufacture, for example, um, there, there are networks and, and abilities to use, let's say, for instance, abattoir waste to make fertilizer to grow plants, for example. So there could be a mutual swap where a farmer could give a company a certain ingredient in their process and they can give them fertilizer back from the waste of the process, for example. So there'll be a mutual swap somewhere there. So we, we do envisage all these things and we hope that more people join our network and uh, people come with their ideas and implement them and, and that we grow in a way that we can have more and more impact on the environment, essentially, because this is where it all started. It wasn't a case of people don't have food or access to it. Everybody has access to a supermarket or a, a, a green grocer today. It's all about creating the community and the awareness that waste is impacting our environment, essentially. And obviously this is because of the energy and the, the fuel and all the things that, that are around the way we produce food. So yeah, that's it in a nutshell. I, I'd like to close here and and um, yeah, if anybody has any questions or ideas, please throw them forward. Thank you very much, Fane, for that introduction. Um, just, as, just as a side note, if any of our panelists like to, would like to switch on their camera, they can now because we had a technical issue at the start of the webinar, but now it should be um, solved. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Um, so thank you again, Kane. Um, I just have a couple of questions and I also encourage our participants here. We are, there are almost 50 participants um, attendees with us in the room. Um, I have a couple of questions. You mentioned that um, uh, you focus mainly, I think, on uh, your background as a, at least your family's background is as farmers. You mentioned uh, produce. Is it just fruit and veg that the platform sort of focuses on or, or are there other foods which people share? To be honest with you, the, the most popular types of foods that people are sharing are, are processed foods that come from, from supermarkets mm -hmm. um, or maybe unwanted Christmas presents like alcohol yeah. and stuff like that. And um, it's very varied. And um, to be honest, 
mostly it's the processed type of foods because our members, most of our members are not farmers. Um, but then we also have um, companies like bakeries. Let's say, for instance, there are big bakeries where they have a, a specific standard when they produce food. So they would either weigh the bread or look at the shape of the bread. And if it's not aesthetically pleasing, they sometimes will post it on food swap. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes they wouldn't even want anything in return. They just wouldn't want their produce to be wasted. Um, but I mean, it is very varied. Sometimes I'm surprised and we've had the people even swap services for food or we've had people swap um, kids' toys, furniture, pet food. Um, so yes, it is called food swap, but people build this sort of community around it and they start to swap all sorts of different things, which is beautiful because um, it kind of develops and, 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 and takes its own route and path, you know. But the idea here is that it's a community, people are sharing experiences, sharing recipes, and um, they're even, they're even like, uh, swapping like empty jars for processing and canning so there's, there's a big community around it and, and a lot of people are conversing and that's the beauty of it and and yeah so it, it's a bit of everything really that's great and it's, it's nice yeah. to see that the platform hasn't just sort of um, kept its focus on food on food specifically um, uh, because at the end of the day, in a truly sort of circular economy, you have to consider all types of waste, not just organic waste. Um, and that's, that's, that's really great. Um, I was reading up a, a bit on your uh, platform, and I also read that you'd like to turn it into sort of a digital, um, maybe an app or a website of some sort. Could you sort of explain a bit more on your idea or what you'd like to do with Foodswap Malta going forward? Yes, um, we, we had this idea some time ago and we were developing it. But so like many things, um, the pandemic sort of halted it a bit because yeah. we were going to do a student-run project where they create an app similar to a dating app where you swipe left and right. Um, and it gives you the location of where the product is that's being swapped and quantities. And you would swipe left or right and then it would kind of match the two individuals that have things to swap. Um, let's say, for instance, somebody's wanting to swap their excess zucchini harvest and I want to sw uh, swap something with zucchini, I would swipe left to accept that swap and it, it would kind of pair us up. Um, so we're looking into developing this and we, we do ask people to reach out if they have the knowledge, the, the technical knowledge to pull this off because... I myself don't, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, we, we do want to develop it that way as well. And um, as well as we mentioned, maybe have a physical drop off point or maybe when the app is developed, you, you can choose maybe if you don't have time to meet that person on a specific place and time, there will be sort of a drop off uh, area like like similar to book swapping boxes that you'd find um, for instance, at university campus, there are there are little boxes you can leave books and then pick up another book. And um, so we want to make it as easy. easy as possible because we know that people these days. And it's not down to the individual, but people these days just don't have a lot of time. And um, yeah, this is the idea moving forward. Right? Um, I think I lost you for a second. I'm not sure if it's my connection or it's yours, but I, but I, uh, but I. Okay. Got it. All right. Um, I think fact, it was his connection, Gabriel. All right. No worries. No worries. Uh, okay. Um, can I? Uh, where Where did I cut off? Maybe I can go again. I think the last part that I heard clearly was the idea about uh, the book boxes and how it can translate um, um, to food. Yes. Yeah, so basically we'll have these common locations. There could even be uh, participating businesses like in a, in a town. It could be a shop that chooses to, to say, okay, I'll, I'll uh, allocate an area in my shop so that people can come and swap as well. Um, and we can develop it as well so, so that maybe a charity can provide a service so you could have people volunteering for that charity that could provide a particular service and then you could swap things. Let's say, for instance, 
um, a dog's home or a cat shelter, for example. Um, there, there could be some advice on, I don't know, animal behavior from one of the volunteers and people could swap their unwanted dog food or, or whatever like this, you know? So it could be developed it quite uh, in, in quite, quite a community-based thing, but at the same time, its roots are, are to safeguard the, the food that we produce and to not waste it essentially because um, even food waste creates pollution. So if you put food waste into a landfill um, and don't dispose of it correctly so you're not fixing the carbon from it, it can release methane into the atmosphere. Um, methane is one of the gases that is not spoke about as much as CO2, for example, when we think about environmental damage. Um, and a substantial amount of this comes from food waste. And there are lots of facts and figures of how much food waste per person is, is uh, created each year. But I think the, the figures that we have are probably a bit skewed because farmers have wastage on the land where they're growing food itself. So I don't think that the surveys account for that wastage where the market has dropped and the produce is just left there, you know. Um, so perhaps the actual figures are a bit skewed. Um, and this is why our, our network is set out. So that even maybe there could be a swap of service between a, fruit, a food producer and a farmer. So they produce a canned license item. They'll give it back to the farmer and they'll take a cut of the sales. Um, so there's a lot of this sort of culture around the food swap malter, although at the moment, most of our users are, are people at home. There are a lot of companies that are, are gaining interest in the concept of sort of swapping service for food to reduce waste. Yes, and it's great to see this um, growth, especially in just one year, I think you've been running the- Yes, the uh, about that, yes. About a year. Um, we already have some, some comments. Um, uh, so yeah, there are people who are telling you that this is a great initiative and well done. Um, so, um, someone mentioned that they tried to access your platform, but they could they weren't able to. So maybe um, after your intervention, you can leave the link um, to the platform in the chat. So and sure. if anyone would like to join, um, they have a direct link there. Okay. Um, Glenn also mentioned that um, the, the concept that's, that you were alluding to about the book boxes and the food boxes is something that the UK is already doing. Um, we also have a comment. I think you partially addressed this already in your intervention, but it's good to repeat it um, in case someone didn't catch it. Um, Jason is asking, how do people on your platform contact each other? Okay, um, on the platform itself, since it's on social media, they use the, the social media um, messaging services that are attached to the social media um, and they're all part of a, a community group online and they just message each other or use comments on the posts that they use to to sort of advertise their swap um, let's say for instance most of them we ask them when they join that when they make a post to swap an item let's say for instance someone wants to swap a plant that Ideally, they take a picture of it, uh, they specify the location of where they are, um, and perhaps as well what they're willing to swap for if they're, if they're wanting to swap for something specific. Um, so yeah, and then the, the people can comment on that particular post or message directly to the person. Um, quite, often, quite often, I mean, it, it's really nice because the people on the community are very active and you get used to the certain individuals and what they have. One common one, and, and you start to see the seasonality of food swap is where people, let's say for instance, have a fruit tree in their garden, like a lemon tree or something. And there, there are too many lemons for one person to consume. So they would pose the same thing and you, and eventually you know who to go to, to swap. So let's say for instance, I know that I don't have a lemon tree, but I have an orange tree. So during citrus season, I know who to go to eventually. So you, you kind of build your contact base and you have their phone numbers, you know where they live, you know, and it creates a community rather than 
having to rely on it all the time, you know? Um, Kane, okay, thank you very much for your time. Um, it was an excellent introduction to Full Swap Mode, and I encourage all our participants to actually visit the platform when Kane posts the link, and join and even contribute, um, comp contribute if you can. Um, and I wish you all the best, Kane, with growing this platform further and actually contributing towards making a change in this important area. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I look forward to the rest of the, the introductions to different ideas as well. Thank you. So now we're going to move on to um, another new initiative uh, called Second Bytes Malta. We have Malcolm Bowden with us today. Uh, Malcolm, are you, with, are you here? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. If you'd like to switch on your camera, feel free. We've solved the technical issue at the beginning. Yeah. Um, I would like, obviously, to do a presentation. Can I share my screen? Or... Yes, yes. You have the full right to so share your screen. Uh, it should be possible. Okay, let me try and tell me. Please tell me if it works. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. Yes, of course. One second. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. No. I did share screen and I can least, see it. At least I can't see it. I don't know if Kane, Kane can you see his screen? Um, no. 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 Oh. I'm sharing it. I'm sorry. I don't know what else I can do. If, if you'd like, I can share it myself. Um, yeah, could you? Uh, one second. Um, sure, let me just bring up your presentation. Try that. Try that. Just try that. Oh, I think I'm seeing your screen now. All right. Are you seeing my Are you seeing my screen now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity, Gabriel. I appreciate it. And Kane, I'm very interested in what you did. When you see the end of mine, you might uh, you might see that we need to talk at some stage. <laughs> So a little bit of background. Um, in the UK, you can probably guess from my accent, I am English. Um, we formed a second byte community interest company. It's not a kind of company that you have in Malta, um, but we can incorporate in the UK rather than a commercial enterprise, a social enterprise, which will use profits and its assets for public good. So it started really where we, we have opened uh, four different dining venues in the northeast of England uh, from Newcastle. So we have a bistro, we have a ve vegetarian, vegan restaurant, a pizzeria and a cafe. And the cafe we operate with the local authority. There's a Roman fort called Segedunum, and we operate the cafe there. The idea really is we set up Second by Malta and it's being set up as we speak as a registered voluntary organization to emulate the UK model, but of course we will have to modify it for, um, uh, for Maltese market. So we signed an MOU in January this year and our plan is beginning of next year, 2022, um, we, will, we will go live with Second Byte Malta and it will be a franchisee of the model. So that's the background. Let me now, you might say, well, why am I here talking about restaurants? Let's now talk about the three areas of social need that we try to address uh, with Second Bite. The first is we partner with lots of retailers in the UK, Morrisons, Asda, Sainsbury's, those kind of companies, and also with food banks to utilize short shelf life products and incorporate them into meals, which can be eaten fresh or frozen, or we can preserve them for later reheating. So the first thing is we obviously buy food as well for the restaurant, but we take in surplus food to be used and then we work with private and government partners and, um, and volunteers and produce and deliver meals made from these produce to socially disadvantaged people. At the moment, I think we've done about 80,000 meals that we do. So we take in the pr produce, we operate in restaurants. That's part of our financing plan effectively. The money we make in the restaurant funds Second Bite as a community interest company. And the third one is improving opportunities. So people who have complex barriers to employment, we give them industry recognized qualifications. They come and work in the restaurants, do hands-on work experience, 
do volunteering in real world catering and hospitality environments. So basically there's those three things which are linked together. You take surplus food, you use that to train people uh, for work, which could be front of house or back of house. You also then produce the stuff that you produce. You don't throw in a bin, et cetera. You then deliver it out to people in need in the area. So it's this three pronged attack. Um, sorry to so interrupt you, Malcolm, food. Um, but I'm not sure whether you're changing your slide, because we're still stuck on the first slide. Oh, I am sharing slides, but um, I apologize. I, I honestly no. don't know what's happening. My slides are moving, um, but it doesn't seem it doesn't seem like you're seeing them. Okay, now now it's moving. Uh, maybe you'd like to. Maybe you can present um, present. Yeah, I was in presentation you. mode. Maybe that doesn't work. So. The first one is reducing feed waste. Yes, food yes, waste, yes, sorry. So we work with the stakeholders. They donate produce, as I said, close to the best before date. That is donated. I've shown an example there of some of these stuff that we get in every single day from supermarkets, convenience stores, and very closely we work with food banks. One thing we find about food banks, and Kane, I know you're talking about fresh produce, maybe the UK isn't as good at, you know, as good at cooking as Malta, but if you find disadvantaged people giving them raw produce when they've, you know, maybe even homeless, maybe, you know, they live in pretty bad conditions, they often just can't use it. They can't cook, if you know what I mean. So therefore using that to train people to cook. So we have cookery classes, teach attendees how to prepare and preserve the meals using basic ingredients. We also invite in uh, people from different ethnic backgrounds uh, to come in and show what they would do with it. So therefore you might get one day where we have an Indian uh, cook in who is showing people you know, what they would do with this produce. So you get this social integration piece as well. So we've got lots of local partners. It does add a local cohesion and effectiveness around um, reducing food waste. So that's kind of the first leg of what we do. The second one is relieving food poverty. As I say, the work that is done by both our chefs and the trainees is then made into meals, which we then deliver. Sometimes they're fresh, people want to eat fresh. Sometimes they're frozen. If someone has a microwave, they may well want to uh, eat it later in the day, etc. And the funding for that really comes from working with local and central government departments, so immigration service, for example, social services, NGOs, uh, to get the list of people. We don't just walk around the street, obviously, giving this food away. We have people that we deliver to every day, and they change as their circumstances might change. I've mentioned the food banks before. We also have private companies. It's very big in the UK that you must have a, co a corporate and social responsibility agenda. You must actually say what you're going to do in your business to improve um, social, uh, social conditions in your area. And so we can effectively subcontract that from people. If they want to fund, they want to pay, that we will deliver the meals. If they want to, we can put their logo on the meal, for example, so someone knows that this particular company has bought this number of meals to be given away. All of this is free, by the way, to be given away uh, to people who require it. Opportunities, this is a very big one for us. Uh, again, we work very closely with uh, local and central government, job centers, the probation service, the immigration service, social services, etc., to try to identify people who have uh, complex barriers to employment. Let's put it that way. Also, private companies can sponsor people. They can either sponsor maybe families of people who work for them or just give a sponsorship and say, I will sponsor you know, 10 people or whatever. Please take them on your course, which can be eight weeks, 12 weeks, uh, whatever uh, they do back of house. In other words, work in the kitchen, but also front of house. And uh, I think the big advantage we have is having real commercial entities it's fine doing training just in a kitchen environment, but until you've worked in a kitchen where there are customers outside, you don't really get to understand whether catering or working in the catering profession is for you. Not everybody wants to be a chef. Some people want to work front of house, so we can give that experience as well, interacting with customers, etc. So 
again, these are the areas of funding uh, that we get uh, to enable to do this. I've given a couple of examples of people we have helped. There's a couple, um, a gay couple from El Salvador who, who had actually suffered a lot of violence and persecution because of their sexual orientation. They came to the UK, obviously have applied to the UK Home Office uh, for right of uh, stay, and they were sent to the Northeast. They went to a charity that we work with, a charity who give us the names of people who require um, meals, for example. And that charity sent them to us. So we took them through our program. Uh, they've got their uh, level two food hygiene certificates, uh, lots of valuable professional kitchen experience. And we do work with other agencies. So we've now got them on a year long English for speakers of another language, an ESOL course, to help them with obviously moving uh, into UK. Another one, a young adult, um, Avery, uh, who has uh, pretty bad ADHD in autism and found it very hard to engage with people. She did, she was socially isolated, uh, lived in a flat on her own, lacking confidence, and she had no real long-term goals. Her mother, by the way, worked for one of the uh, charities and she put Avery forward and we took Avery obviously on a course and she loves doing it. Um, and actually, we took her on now. She ha is a full-time apprentice with Second Bite. So it is very good when some of the people who come through this actually finish up working for our company. Sorry. Yeah, so really, there's three distinct and interconnected social objectives. The first is we get trainees. I'm sorry, this is supposed to be a bill, but it's not really... It seems like my screen is not working if it's uh, if I'm in presentation mode. So we have trainees, which, which are provided either by local companies or by um, various organiza organizations. We then have our learning academy, which turns out that we then produce hospitality staff, so staff who have been trained in kitchen operations, etc. They then work in this kitchen operation and produce the food, which is then delivered to people in deprived areas. So basically, that's kind of the model that we have. We have the training. We have the delivery of food. In fact, I think my screen jumped a little bit. Yeah, these are the kind of the, the, the meals that we do. And basically, that's really the model. We have these three interconnected things. It starts with food, you know, kind of stopping food waste by taking, which is why I was interested in what Cain was talking about. We have great relationships with um, businesses in the UK and charities in the UK and food banks in the UK. They carry on doing what they're doing, giving away produce, etc., to people who want produce they're going to cook on their own where one arm where they then deliver it to us as well and we convert it into meals and then deliver to to families as well so it's really this three three pronged attack stop food waste train people in the use of cooking and and, and hospitality then delivering meals uh, free of charge obviously to people who need the food so very quickly i'll come back now if i may so I stop sharing Uh, thank you very much, Malcolm. Um, no problem at all. It was very quick, but I thought we really only have 15 minutes, including questions. So I did that very quickly for you. Yes, yes. It's a, it's a, it's a. First of all, it's a beautiful concept and very um, a huge well done. And I really like the how we sort of you bridge different issues, um, some social, some economic, and you bring them together um, through one solution. And I think especially now in Malta, um, as the MPB, we represent also the Malta Hotels and Restaurants Association. And we obviously we see a clear issue that at the moment, many restaurants and hotels have a huge shortage of staff. They, they don't have enough staff to work with. So Indeed. The, these sort of, sort of solutions that can actually get people who are out of work at the moment working in this important sector, especially in Malta, I think uh, it's a win for everyone. 
Well, we found, by the way, that Gabriel, for a different reason, but not, not a different reason, but because of Brexit in the UK, of course, and then COVID as well, you had a lot of staff who have you know, left the country. Effectively, we have the same problem in the UK, that uh, getting trained staff is very difficult. And I think, you know, adding this together of training them and placing them, and we've got places where they, they can say, I have worked in a busy bistro, you know, on a Saturday evening, I understand what I'm getting into because a kitchen, a kitchen on a Saturday evening is not the same as standing in there, you know, standing in college, taking as long as you want to make a spaghetti bolognese. It's just not the same, you know. Yes, as I think it was an issue of work permits, um, expiring work permits, so people have to go. But um, I think we should really believe in the potential of these people who are currently not working, but they do have talent, they do have skill, and they can do have the drive if we can give them the confidence. Um, uh, what I'd like to ask you is that you mentioned that um, in the Maltese context, you will have to work with uh, restaurants, private businesses. Have you already approached uh, some of these businesses to sort of gauge their interest, or is that still uh, something that you have to do? Well, at the, I'll be honest, the first part of it was which, you know, how do we replicate this in Malta? Do we have to change the business model slightly? So we've talked to a number of government agencies about the funding, about having somewhere to work, etc. And those, those talks are quite well advanced, to be frank with you. We're still not sure whether opening a restaurant is the right thing to do. I mean, I would want to do that, I'll be honest. That's, that's what I would like to do. You know, I think having this real life experience is very important. It'd be quite easy to set up a commercial kitchen, take in the food, do the training piece, and deliver out to uh, people in need. All we need is you know, agencies who will work with us to give us a list of people who need, who deserve to be trained, and a list of people who deserve to be delivered food. And then we can work with, you know, Pit Carly. We can work with anyone. And by the way, that's why I was very interested in Keynes. I don't want to take over all of that, but if there was surplus food that wasn't swapped, for example, what a great idea to work with us to, you know, to give us that food when we're up and running and we can turn that into meals. Um, but we still really haven't decided whether or not, and by the way, there are plenty of open restaurants, uh, you know, after COVID. And we did some very good deals. I'll be open with you in the UK with owners uh, particularly in big um, centers, for example, you know, where in a big retail park where the companies had gone bust, I'll be honest with you, and the, the owners of the center, you know, wanted some social responsibility and were willing to do the rental on a, prof on a, on a share of takings, if you know what I mean, rather than us committing to big rentals. So that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about. If you're sitting, you know, with an empty restaurant as the owner and you've got no income coming in, then maybe it's better to, you know, work with someone like Second Bite and say we'll do a, a share, a profit share deal, rather than we'll take over your restaurant and pay normal rental, etc. Yeah, and anyone who's like that may well believe they're doing some social good if a lot of that is training and a lot of, you know, food is being delivered out of there free of charge to people in need. So I'm, we're exploring those to be honest. If anybody has a restaurant, please feel free to drop me a line if it's empty. Um, yes, and I also agree with your um, with your assessment about collaborating with Food Swap Malta. From my own perspective, at least from the outside looking in, I see um, your both both of your platforms as complementary uh, rather than competing. But obviously, I, I would leave that to both of you to sort of uh, figure it out, figure out um, uh, how it work would work. Um, and also, uh, Malcolm. Do get in touch with MBB. I know that um, uh, your colleagues have already spoke to our CEO, but as I said, as, as yeah. representatives of the Malta Hotels and Restaurants Association, if you're in a stage where you'd like to contact hospitality businesses or businesses in the food service sector, um, then please do let us know how we can support you in reaching out. Thank um, you very much, and thank you for your ongoing help anyway. I mean, we have been in touch before, yes. and we've been in touch with a a number. If you look at those three things, you have kind of job center, you know, job plus side who want to get people trained. You have people like yourselves who want to stop food waste and you have other people who are responsible for the social needs of disadvantaged people who perhaps require food. So, you know, we have to talk to three different departments and that's absolutely fine. And I think at one stage we need to all come together and then decide what the uh, what the model will be.
Yes, exactly. And um, we also have a comment in the chat. So, um, another person agrees that a collaboration between food swap and the second bite would benefit both models. And yeah, uh, Dimitri, you well done to both of you. We have another question. So, Malcolm, great initiative. Since the model relies on surplus food, how do you handle the less stable source of food production? Since you don't know how much waste will be generated. Yeah. I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Is it? Can we just rephrase it? The how do you handle the less stable source of food production? So um, you mean if we can't get? Yeah, <laughs> we have a we, you know we have a number of meals that we make. Please don't get the idea we can make everything from donations. We actually use the I'll use the word profit, but the income from the restaurant is totally ring fenced, and of course we have to buy protein, for example. You know what? We don't get many donations of sirloin steaks or, you know, chickens and things like that. So we have to buy food as well. And then we then have we're very good chefs who have a set of menus that they know. And if sometime we get a load of tomatoes, then we've got a pizzeria, etc. So depending what we get in, we change the menus both in the restaurant and in the, um, the food that we delivered free of charge. We change those depending upon what we're getting, we're getting given. But yes, you have to be fast on your feet. I think, yes, you understood the question correctly. Um, yes. Uh, they told you thank you. Someone yeah, we have to buy food as well. I wish we could do everything with gifts, but we don't. <laughs> I mean, we, you know, <laughs> we still have to buy food. But at the end of the day, maybe it's a good thing that people aren't throwing away meat, because that would be, I think, one of the worst types of food to throw away. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, you have another comment that it's an interesting idea. How can we contact you? So maybe you can leave your contact details in the chat um, after your presentation. Of course, I uh, feel free. By the way, you obviously have the contact details of of everyone, if you know what I mean. If yeah. I drop you, Gabriel, my second bite uh, email address, you have my GS1 Malta one. I'm the chairman of GS1 Malta as well. Yes. But if I send you my second bite address direct, Gabriel, I'm quite happy. For you to share that with all of the attendees, if that's uh, yes, that would if that's be okay with you, that would be perfect. Yeah. Because after the after this webinar, we're sharing a recording, so just in case someone joined late or they had to leave early, um, uh, and we can also leave contact details of any of the speakers who would like to share their their details. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's it for the questions. Thank you very much, Malcolm. It was a very very interesting presentation, and I wish you best of luck um, uh, with um, with Second Bite Malta. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Thank you. Finally, we have Alex Kushki from the Ministry for the Environment, um, who is going to present. Hi, Alex. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. I think you're muted. Hi, good morning. Hi. Um, uh, Alex is going to present um, uh, Malta's uh, waste management plan. I think it's still in the drafting phase, right, Alex? Uh, so we did release um, the full draft for public consult consultation in December yeah. 2020, um, and we have taken on board the comments and the final um, version should be published within the coming months. Uh, today I'll just focus on one or two initiatives that are already um, significantly developed, um, just to kind of give an idea of, of what's happening at ministry level. Super, I'll leave the floor to, um, I'll leave the floor. Um, I think you can share your screen if you'd like to share the presentation. Yes. Um, I'm just going to turn my camera off before I share the screen so that it doesn't... Thank no you. problem, no problem. Are you seeing this okay? Uh, yes. And if I move between slides, are you seeing that as well? Yes, but you're not in full screen. Um, How about now? Yes, we're seeing the... Con yes, Waste Management September 2021. Okay, fantastic. Um, first of all, thank you, Gabriel, for having me speak today, and thank you to Malcolm and Kane for their um, excellent initiatives. It was great to hear more about what is happening on the ground in Malta. Um, so as I mentioned briefly, I will share um, a little bit of information about um, organic waste initiatives so far and the ones that are in progress at the moment. Um, there are several ongoing, however, I focused in the interest on ta of time on the ones that are already significantly um, in the process of implementation. So today, I'll give a little bit of background about two previous campaigns, which kind of led us to where we are today. And these are the household organic waste um, collection rollouts. 
the trifocal campaign, which focused on households and commercial establishments. I'll provide some information on EU legislation on organic waste, as well as a proposed national legislation, which was outlined in the waste management plan. Um, and this is mandatory separation. And also I'll share two initiatives uh, which are in the process of implementation, which aim to support this upcoming legislation. I'm sure many of you are aware of the impacts of food waste and why it's so important to act on it, but just to give a brief background for those who may not be so familiar, um, one third of food produced globally for human consumption is lost or wasted. And food waste, as mentioned previously, has significant environmental impacts as well as economic and social impacts. Um, to give you an idea on the amount on the environmental impacts, food waste is obviously wasted resources in terms of land, energy, water, and all of the resources that grow into that go into um, growing the food, storing the food, transporting, um, and for this to all go to waste. Um, an, an estimate from 2013 estimated that 3.3 billion tons of CO2 is released from this wasted food. And actually, when food waste decomposes in landfill, it releases methane, which is a more harmful greenhouse gas in terms of global warming potential. Um, and therefore, obviously, everyone has an obligation to um, take action on this issue. So to begin with the household organic waste collections, um, this was rolled out nationally in Malta in October of 2018, following um, a pilot trial in several localities. And in the first full year of implementation, which is the uh, calendar year 2019, more than 27,000 tons of organic waste was collected from households, um, which is obviously a significant amount being diverted away from landfill and towards anaerobic digestion, which produces energy from this food waste. In the spring and summer of 2019, the ministry was involved in implementing an EU life project called Trifocal. And this was led by uh, Resource London and was implemented across several cities and countries across the EU. And the campaign focused specifically on the prevention of food waste, which as Kay mentioned earlier, is, is obviously the key place to start. It also focused on the promotion of healthy and sustainable eating. Um, so for example, more plant forward diets and as well as the recycling of unavoidable food waste. So once all, all steps have been taken to prevent food waste where possible, it's important that any remaining food waste is disposed of correctly so that it doesn't end up in landfill. And the audience of these campaigns were households and food businesses. You may have seen some of these posters around social media and several events during that summer. I'd like to focus on just the first one at the moment, um, with which the data was correct for that year which was if everyone in Malta had recycled one banana skin, we could create enough energy to charge more than 951,000 mobile phones. And that is just the energy if everyone recycled one banana skin. So you can only imagine the potential if everyone were to correctly separate and recycle all organic waste which, which was generated. As part of the campaign, we also undertook a pilot project of organic waste separation and collection from nine catering establishments in Marsa Scala. This was a voluntary initiative, um, but it was great to have such active participation. The participating establishments were provided with barcoded bags for organic waste and for mixed waste. And this waste was then weighed once it reached waste serve. So we had a better idea of how much organic waste was being generated from restaurants, which prior to this project, there was little to no information on. Um, and then, of course, this organic waste, instead of going directly to landfill from the black bag, it's, it was converted into renewable energy uh, via anaerobic digestion. The project also provided the opportunity for the establishments to provide input and feedback on collections, and this information was then used to develop upcoming policy further. Uh, a key issue is typically the collection time. Uh, due to different closing times of certain establishments, a standardized collection time was not always um, the most convenient option. And this is a big, um, this was a big factor in one of the initiatives I'm going to mention later. And on top of this, we also provided dedicated food waste prevention training where we went one on one uh, alongside WasteServe to each of the establishments that wanted to take part in this. Um, and helped them with ways to prevent food waste, which could help save money, and of course, to recycle any leftovers appropriately. 
This is an example of some of the co communication materials that were used during the campaign. And these were developed from RAP, the Waste Resources and Action Programme in the UK. They were a partner of the Trifocal campaign. So we had access to their materials from the Your Business is Food, Don't Throw It Away campaign. And this included uh, things like a tracking sheet where people could track the types of waste being generated and at which stage. For example, if waste was generated because it was spoiling too soon, perhaps that item was um, being overordered or whether the, the waste was generated at the preparation stage or at the customer plate waste stage. And you probably won't be surprised to find out that the majority of waste in Malta was generated at the customer plate side, which provided some insight into then actions, appropriate actions that could be taken to reduce the amount of waste on a plate. To give a, a very basic example by offering different portion sizes at different prices. The summary checklist also provided some ideas of what can be done at different stages. For example, there are actions that can be taken at the purchasing and ordering stage. There's actions that could be taken at the storage stage, preparation, customer plate waste, et cetera. And this was an exhaustive list um, just intended to provide some food for thought on ways to do things differently if it suited um, their business. And we also provided some information on exactly what could go in the white bag. Um, this, the organic waste generated in kitchens is not necessarily identical to organic waste generated at home. So we felt it was important to have a specific um, communications message on this. And some outcomes of this project, we found that we had increased communication with the general public via social media. Um, we were monitoring the Don't Waste Waste page, which was utilized to promote this campaign um, throughout. And it was, it was interesting um, because we were hearing from people directly and that also kind of boosted engagement between the ministry and the public. We were present at the International Food Festival in the July of that year, and we had positive engagement with attendees on all sorts of issues relating to the campaign. And we had more than 200 pledges of actions that people could take to reduce their own food waste and reduce their own environmental impact. In terms of the organic waste collections, we, over the six week period, we collected, or waste serve, sorry, collected 2.7 tons of food, which was then diverted away from landfill. And the data that was gathered showed that more than 60% of the waste that was um, thrown out was organic. This was by weight. Um, therefore, it, kind of highlighted a significant opportunity to further reduce the amount of waste going to landfill by tackling organic waste from commercial establishments. So the waste management plan for the years 2021 to 2030 was issued for public consultation, as I mentioned in December of last year, some of you may be aware of the contents. There was an entire chapter on waste prevention, which um, focused on uh, very heavily on food, um, because obviously the, the first step of the waste management hierarchy is to prevent waste where possible, and then obviously to take action as appropriate. To give some background on EU legislation on the matter, the Waste Framework Directive um, has stated that by 2023, bio-waste, which includes food waste, must either be separated and recycled at source or collected separately and not mixed with other types of waste. Waste. And this legislation applies to um, every stage of the supply chain. And it's very important to note that this applies to household, restaurants, caterers, and retail premises. Uh, so, of course, this forms a basis for some of the upcoming legislation. And the proposed legislation in Malta is that we will have mandatory separation of organic and recyclable waste from all households and commercial establishments. Um, and this is due to be implemented in 2022. This was a year before the EU stipulated deadline. However, um, there is a lot of merit for implementing this as soon as possible. So the regulations will be introduced, which mandate all commer commercial establishments to separate their waste at source. And this is not just focused on organic waste, but also um, recyclables, paper and cardboard, plastic and glass. Um, that it will be considered an offence to not separate waste, and this will also be coupled by heightening the enforcement capacity uh, to make sure that businesses are complying. 
So in order to ease this transition into the new regulations, which have been um, communicated publicly already in the waste management plan, um, the ministry is undergoing two key initiatives. And one is the free collection of organic waste from catering establishments in tourism areas. Uh, these tourism areas have already been established by um, a previous legal notice for the Ministry for, uh, for Tourism. And the aim of this is to encourage voluntary organic waste separation prior to the mandatory deadline. Um, organizations can leave their organic waste outside for collection after service on weekends, and it will be collected Saturday and Sunday mornings between 1 and 5 a.m. And this, will also, this waste will also be weighed when it reaches the waste facilities, which will enable um, a more large scale data gathering exercise on the amount of organic waste being generated by the sector. In Gozo, um, the ministry is piloting smart waste depots. There are currently two sites identified and um, the process is underway. And the purpose of this is a centralized collection point for organic waste allowing for the separate disposal of, um, sorry, organic waste and residual waste. So this will only be the white bag and the black bag. But a key point to note is that it will be accessible 24-7. Um, it's access controlled, so only commercial outlets that are given an access card will be able to access the storage area where these containers um, remain. And this, the fact that they're accessed uh, accessible 24-7 um, means that it, it's completely flexible for commercial users, uh, regardless of the time that they finish service. Uh, whenever they want to dispose of waste, they can access. The bins themselves will have fill, fill level sensors. So um, once the waste reaches a certain level, it will send an automatic alert to the local councils for, then, for them to then arrange the collection of this waste. It will help to identify locations with the highest demand to see if um, potential further action needs to be taken in that area on food waste prevention, or if there needs to be uh, potentially more bins or more frequent collections. And once this is expanded, it will be able to suggest the shortest route for collection optimization uh, based on the fill level sensors. And again, the waste collected here will also be weighed at WasteServe, which will enable further accurate data collection on um, the amount of organic waste generated by restaurants and other commercial establishments. So thank you for your time. Um, I believe there is a Q&A session about to happen now. So please uh, feel free to ask any questions if you have any, I'll be happy to answer them. And if, if I'm not able to, I'll um, be sure to pass on your request to someone who can. Thank you very much, Alex. And uh, thank you for especially introducing the waste management plan for the benefit of um, those of us which uh, who might not have been aware that this plan has actually been drafted and was up for consultation. Um, um, and it's also great to see that there are initiatives to actually support commercial establishments in this transition as, um, because obviously it's a major change to what we have been doing and now um, uh, we need to shift to more sustainable practices, but at least there is support. There are already some or two comments in the chat um, uh, for you, Alex. Um, Kane is asking whether the product produced by anaerobic digest di the digester is usable. Um. Thank you. And that is a very good question. Um, at the moment, as far as I'm aware, they are still working on reaching the EU standards for um, the compost digestate to be uh, utilized. However, outlined in the, in, in the waste management plan is the intention, and you may have heard um, of the EcoHive project, which will see a, new, a brand new organic processing plant being filled, sorry, being um, built uh, with the intention that it will have the capacity to generate all of the organic waste in Malta. And as, as far as I understand, the intention for this is for the byproduct of that to be utilized. That's all um, the information I have on that in the moment. Yes, and, and to be fair, perhaps that, that question would be more suited for Baser than the Ministry for the Environment. Um, uh, Malcolm also passed a comment that he agrees with the issue of portion sizes, especially in Malta, since small portions are rather large, and it would benefit to offer different sizes um, uh, instead of just leaving half the plate there and throwing it away, for example. Um, we also have another question, but I, but I suspect that, again, Wayserve would be better suited for this question. Um, uh, 
the, the, the participant is wondering whether um, it is damaging or polluting for organic waste to be put in plastic bags, not, not the proper organic waste bags, um, and this to be processed as she believes that they are burnt, that the, the waste is burnt. Okay, um, that is not a question that I could answer with full confidence. Um, I, I believe that would be waste serve that would yes. be able to provide, but I can certainly pass on that question um, and get an answer if that would help. Yes, yes, and if you'd like, if you get a, an answer from waste, if you can then share the replies um, with, with um, uh, the participants. Certainly. Unless there are any other questions, um, I will have to bring this webinar to a close. We were right on time. Um, so thank you to all the speakers for keeping to your keeping to your um, uh, allotted slots. Um, it was a very, very interesting discussion. And thank you to all the participants for um, their questions. I would like to leave the floor uh, for a second to Glenn Bujeya from, from HSBC. Um, uh, who will um, uh, deliver the closing remarks uh, to close this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel, for that. Um, no, I just wanted to thank Gabriel and the Mota Business Bureau for organizing um, this uh, webinar. And I also would like to thank Alexandra, Kane, and Melkin for their interventions. And we look forward to have you on board for our next uh, sessions in the near future. That's all from my end. Um, thank you very much. Thank you again. I encourage you all to visit our respective social media pages and uh, like um, uh, like our pages to be um, to keep up to date with what we are doing. This is this is not a one-off event. Uh, we've organized several different events, not just on food waste, but even on different topics. For example, yesterday the MBB organized an event on the future of Europe, focusing on work environment and the single market. So we cover a variety of different topics, and I also know that that Glenn at HSBC also organizes several events on different topics. So, um, Gabriel, you. maybe yes. I can uh, just ask one question to Melkin, um, whether they have a Facebook page uh, with regards to um, uh, their organization. You're Thank muted, you. Malcolm. You might hear me if I come off mute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I just missed whether we have what? A Facebook have... page, a Facebook page. Uh, yes, yes, certainly. Um, Second Byte has. I mean, Second Byte in the UK. We don't have a Facebook page uh, in Malta yet because we haven't gone live. Uh, but we certainly have a Facebook page. If you look up Second Hyphen Byte on Facebook, okay. you will find our page. Perfect. Thank you for that, Malcolm. Perfect. So we'll keep on the lookout for the for the live launch of Second Byte Malta, and then we can like the Facebook page then. Indeed, I'll have a different Facebook page. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I wish you a good rest of your day um, and keep in touch if you have any questions or would like to learn more about what we discussed today. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.